Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, November 13th, 2022. It focuses on God's new covenant with the peoples of the world. The message to all who will listen is Jesus' work on the cross has made a way for our hearts to be transformed. He has given us freedom from our sinful nature. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Are you ready for God's word? Ready for the new covenant? Yeah. All right. Let's pray together and invite God to make plain to us his truth and to speak his truth into our hearts so we can apply it to ourselves. God, thank you that you are in this place and that you desire for us to know you in truth and in spirit more than we want to know you. And God, those of us who have put our faith in you, we want to know you. We want to be desperate for you. And so, God, more than that, help us to understand. Help us to hear your word and to celebrate your word and give thanks for what you've done and to find joy in that. And God, if there's any here who don't know you as Savior through your son Jesus, I pray, God, that you would convince them through your Holy Spirit's work today that the new covenant that you've provided for us, the salvation that you provided for us, is the best thing that's ever happened. In Jesus' name, amen. Math was never my favorite subject in school. I am not saying that I was bad at it. I just didn't like it. So when I entered college, I was determined to take as little math as possible. What was required and not a whit more. Imagine my happiness when my, in my final year at Friends Bible College, I discovered I didn't have to take algebra but could take general math instead and still graduate. I'm sure I could have muddled my way through algebra, but at what cost? Extreme misery. I signed up for the easy course, and I don't regret that choice even a little bit. I am able to do the math that I want to and need to on a regular basis, and I'm pretty pleased with that. A year or two before I signed up for my general math class, I was navigating the coursework for an intro to philosophy class, which met in the library basement. If I remember correctly, this is the one and only class that I fell asleep during. I won't lay the blame at the professor's feet. I probably wasn't getting enough sleep at the time. At the beginning of the semester, the philosophy instructor had invited us to write a contract for the course. We were allowed to put more weight on the things that we thought we would do better at and less weight on the things that we were not quite as confident about. I threw some numbers on my contract and turned it in. About halfway through the course, many of my classmates were failing. They begged for relief, and what our professor offered was the chance to renegotiate contracts. Math suddenly became my friend. I looked at the grades that I'd received on already completed tests and assignments and discovered I could weight those good grades enough that I didn't have to do anything the rest of the semester except show up to class. And that's what I did. I walked into the room each morning, sat down, did as little as possible for the remaining days of my class and got an A and went on my merry way. It's only now, looking back, that I kind of regret my decision. I think if I had applied myself a bit more and had a let's see what I can learn attitude, I might have enjoyed philosophy. Who knows what great insights you would be getting now if I hadn't done that. Alas, all I can offer now is this story and hope that it illustrates for you the difference in some small way between the old covenants, those which we've talked about this last month, and the new covenant, which is our focus today. Under the conditional Mosaic covenant, everyone was failing. No one was living out the perfect obedience that was required to gain life. Under the new covenant, life would be offered to those who would receive by faith in Jesus, the gift that God had for them. That's what we'll see this morning as we move forward. We have already heard from Paul multiple times in this series. In fact, we've read a portion of the passage from Romans 3 I want to start with this morning. I'm repeating myself so that we'll all be on the same page concerning the ability of any man or woman to fully live according to God's standard of goodness. 
At the beginning of Romans 3, Paul writes about the advantages the Jews believe that they have over the heathens, the pagans surrounding them. The descendants of Abraham living in the state think that they've got salvation on lockdown because of their ancestry. It's to these self-righteous Jews, Paul writes the following words in Romans 3, 10 to 20. Make sure you listen carefully, though the original audience is wholly Jewish, what he says applies to all who've inherited a sin nature which prevents them from living according to all of God's laws. Writing to the proud and haughty of Abraham's earthly bloodline, Paul says this, There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. I am not sure there is any clear declaration in the Bible of our inability to save ourselves by our own goodness in this. Paul lays it all out for us, quoting Old Testament passage after Old Testament passage in order to bury any notion that we might have of self-righteousness or self-attained righteousness. Every mouth is silenced before God. Every mouth. No one is going to be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one can live up to the standards of God's law. There is no hope at all if the law is the only way. On our own, we are doomed, damned, done. The Jewish nation, the people with whom God made the conditional Mosaic covenant, didn't keep their end of the agreement. They said, we will do everything God commands, and yet they did not and could not. They couldn't follow through. You and I, we can't either. I don't know what you've done, but I'm aware of my own shortcomings over the years. Here's a quick rundown of a few of the ways that I have violated God's standards. What I'll say now is not even close to a full confession. You ready? I have lied about all sorts of things, stolen once or twice, gossiped about people I love and those I hated. Hatred, that's another one. I've lusted, coveted, been prideful, judged others, turned a blind eye to the poor, disobeyed my parents... Committed violence against others, I have been jealous and selfish. I've said yes to what I should have said no to and no to things I should have shunned. I've used filthy language and told inappropriate jokes. All things that are condemned in the law. When Paul says there's no one good, not even one, I can't dispute his claim. I know I'm not good at all, and don't take it personally, but I've never met a truly good in every way person. Not even any of you. I've met kind people and redeemed people and saved people and helpful people, but none of them were perfect in regard to the law because no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. No one. Let that sink in. Understand it. You are not good enough to earn salvation. No matter your mathematical prowess, you cannot manipulate your way to acceptance into heaven with a lesser percentage of obedience than 100%. There's no renegotiation. Well, you can't renegotiate, but Jesus can. God remedied the impossible situation for a time by accepting repeatable sacrifices of blemish-free animals to deal with sin guilt. The people of Israel sacrificed bulls and sheep and goats over and over and over for their sins. The fact that they had to repeat these things time after time proves that they were not the end game. They were a temporary solution. Listen to what the first verses of Hebrews 10 say says about this. Starting with verse 1, we're going to read through verse 4. It says this, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. 
For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Note the first statement made at the beginning of the chapter, the one about the law being a shadow. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. This single sentence hints at the solution, even as the writer is poised to lay out the inescapable problem we all face. The sacrifices required by the Mosaic Covenant point to the sacrifice which will bring salvation in the New Covenant. These shadow sacrifices cannot save. They can only cover over sin for a moment before the need for a repeat performance pops up. The giver of the animal is going to sin again and again and again and again. Perfect obedience is impossible. That's what Romans 3 told us. Required sacrifices fail to set things right. That's what this passage tells us. Both the law's rules and the law's sacrifices remind of sin, but neither sets free from sin. Neither deals with the inherited bent towards sin that we got from Adam. Our hearts remain unchanged, our souls are unaltered, our minds are still set on evil only all of the time. Just like in Noah's day. Don't answer this out loud. Do you remember what I said a couple weeks ago about the Mosaic Covenant's conditional nature, about why God had to enter into a conditional agreement with mankind? Here's the reason I gave. This conditional covenant makes sure our hope is set on God alone. We have to know that there is no other way so that we will desperately cry out to God for what we need, and that is rescue. Because we can't meet the conditions of the conditional covenant. Rescue is what the new covenant provides. God in love sends Jesus to provide salvation to the world. What no man could ever earn, God gives as a gift through his son Jesus. We're going to see that when we read a bit more of each of these chapters that we've started with, with Romans 3 and Romans 10, but we've got a few things to cover before we get back to them. We're going to go back to the Old Testament for a few minutes now. We need to see a couple of promises that God made concerning the new covenant he was going to enter into with sinful humanity. He, through his prophets, proclaimed the good which was to come, the reality that the sacrifices pointed to. So, the first revelation of the coming covenant, the new one, is found in Jeremiah 31. In verses 31 to 34, God, speaking through his man, Jeremiah, tells his people, both Israel and Judah, that a different kind of covenant is coming down the pike. Hear God's word to his people. I'm reading Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Listen closely to what God's new covenant will be like. The days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor and say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Did you catch it? The covenant to come is going to deal with the hearts and the minds of God's people. Their wills are going to be transformed, and they will know God. All will know God. The low and the high, there's no longer going to be any need for a priest as a go-between, and God is going to forgive wickedness and remember sin no more. I recently listened to a sermon Pastor Tim Keller preached years ago. In it, he quoted a hymn by Samuel Gandy, somewhere between 1780 and 1851. He wrote this. Well, may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. 
Jehovah knoweth none. Can you imagine? An all-knowing God is able to limit his knowledge so that he can forget sin. Kind of blows the mind, doesn't it? Makes you ask how. I don't know how. But I know that he promised to do it and trust that he has done it through Jesus for all who believe. It says, if we have not sinned. All right, ready for prophet number two? I want us to read now Ezekiel 36, 22 to 29. Listen as God spells out another of the good things which will become reality when the new covenant is entered into. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 29 begins with these words. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules." You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. Verses 26 and 27 are key to our understanding of this new covenant. What does God say through Ezekiel in them? He says that men and women will receive new hearts. Their hearts of stone, which are set on evil, bent towards sin, are going to be made soft. This speaks of the transforming power of God's grace to us. In addition to the change of heart, God will put his spirit in each new covenant person. He will help them to walk according to God's laws. They will be able to obey God because God, who cannot sin, lives within them. And he's going to help from within them. His life in them will give them an overcoming sin power. His power, not theirs. Listen, God has forgotten the sins of those who are part of the new covenant. God has changed the hearts of those who are part of the new covenant. He has put his spirit in those who are part of the new covenant. Are you one whose sins are forgotten? One whose heart has been made flesh instead of stone? One in whom the Holy Spirit dwells? Let's return to Romans 3 and Hebrews 10. Immediately after laying out the facts, no one can be declared righteous by the works of the law, Paul introduces us to a new kind of righteousness, one which God gives graciously to those who enter into the new covenant. Let me read a few verses. If you're following along, skim down to verse 21. This is Romans 3, 21 to 26. So no one's righteous. No one's going to be declared righteous according to the works of the law. But here's what he says next. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. We just saw that the prophets testified, right? They said it's coming, this change of heart, this spirit coming. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The new covenant doesn't require the works of the law. It requires faith in Jesus. Those who trust in Jesus receive from God the gift of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, shed his blood on the cross to free all who would believe on him from the guilt and the power of sin. He has taken away our sin. 
And because he rose from the dead, his sacrifice is once for all. It doesn't have to be repeated day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, millennia after millennia. Through faith in Jesus, by the grace of God, sinful men and women can be made righteous for eternity. This new covenant is so much better than the one God made with his people under Moses. This one is the fulfillment of the unconditional promises that God made to Adam and to Abraham and to David. Jesus has crushed the head of the serpent, giving us victory over sin. Jesus has brought blessing to all peoples, making it available to anyone who believes. And Jesus is the king of all mankind whose rule will never, ever, ever end. He's fulfilled those promises. Romans 3 is wrapped up, but we've got to go back to Hebrews 10. We have to bring it full circle as well. We'll read verses 5 to 18 and see what God has to say to us. Remember what we read earlier about the inability of the blood of bulls and goats to save. That's going to be resolved in this passage. So listen as I read Hebrews 10, 5 through 18. Hear what God has done. So verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. The sacrifices of the Mosaic Covenant could not take away sin. You saw that. But the sacrifice Jesus made does. His sacrifice, his blood, his death on the cross for us makes forgiveness possible. Our belief in him puts God's laws into our hearts, writes them on our minds. Those who put their faith in Jesus are transformed changed forever. Jesus, crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, now sits at God's right hand. What is he doing there? This passage says that he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, including that enemy we call death. And Romans 8.34 goes on to say that he is there interceding with the Father for us. Jesus is in heaven at the Father's right hand, praying for us, for our protection from the enemy, for our power over sin, for our unity as a church, for our witness in the world, for our joy made complete in him. You, my friends, if you have put your faith in Jesus, are living under this new covenant. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been set free from the power of sin. You don't have to keep doing the wrong things that the devil tempts you to, and that your flesh desires. You have been given the gift of Christ's righteousness. God's spirit lives in you. He is making you more and more like Jesus and helping you to say yes to God's way and no to the world's. Don't you want to be more like Jesus? The one you love, the one who saved you? It's possible because of what he did. It's possible because of what God has given us through the Spirit and changed our hearts. I invite you now to worship God, to give thanks to Jesus, and to find joy in the presence of the Holy Spirit who's within you if you're a believer. Do all this and look forward to the completion of your redemption. 
You will be with God for eternity, reveling in his glory, worshiping without the weakness that you experience now, the sin nature completely obliterated and gone. Oh, man, I can hardly wait. I'm looking forward to the day when temptation isn't there anymore and that my desires are set on God always and at all times instead of this fickle craziness that's going on now. I'm so grateful for what God's done, aren't you? I invite you to respond to God as we take just a few moments in silence. You can break the silence with praise or thanksgiving or with prayer. You can do that. But let's give thanks to God and seek him. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't entered into this new covenant, there's no better day than today to put your faith in Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. God, I know that I haven't spoken as completely and thoroughly about your new covenant as I could. God, I pray that your spirit would use what I have said to bring joy and conviction and correction and instruction. And God, help us to live in celebration of what you've done. Thank you that you change our hearts and our minds and that you make it so that by your spirit we can live for you. Thank you that we have power over the enemy and that you've crushed the head of Satan. You have set us free and given us your salvation through your son Jesus, your righteousness. I pray, God, that we would walk in that this week, that we would find opportunities to share the good news with others around us and Do it with our words and with practical deeds of love. Help our lives this week to show you to the world and to bring glory to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.